Hi, and welcome to the Growing Solar Podcast. I'm Matt Rea, and today we're talking to Patrick McCabe, who is the president and co-founder of Green Lancer. And uh, Patrick has a number of years of experience in the solar industry, um, working at Borrego Solar as a designer for a number of years, um, and then eventually uh, becoming the founder, uh, one of the co-founders of Green Lancer. So Patrick, welcome to the show. Excited to have you here. Hey, thanks. Appreciate it. So I guess first off, um, would love to hear a little bit about your background in the, in the solar industry and kind of what, what drove you there. Yeah, I think uh, a, a lot of how I found myself in the solar industry is due to my father, um, who's always been a, a conservationist and, and an activist. Um, and I was exposed to uh, Mother Nature and some of these other magazines growing up. And I think once I got out of college, I took a year off uh, to be a ski bum. And during that time, I really became introspective on what what I wanted to do in the future. And, uh, you know, solar being something that was at that time in 2006, uh, a pretty small industry, uh, I knew that the future for solar was going to be big. And so I decided to, uh, you know, put my hat in the ring and I actually got a job at Borrego Solar out in San Diego. Uh, back in 2007. And uh, that's how I got started. But I, th- I would I have to, you know, give credit to my father for kind of getting me in the mind of uh, not only doing what's right, but also what's going to be um, growing and, and something that's, you know, going to be exciting for the future. Right. And so you spent a couple of years at Borrego. How did the, how did your work end up kind of spawning the idea of Green Lancer? Well, at, at the time, I was a design engineer, so I was working within the operation and uh, mostly doing residential, and eventually Borrego expanded to include commercial and utility-sized projects, and so at that time, I moved over to a sales engineering role, and so I was supporting a uh, nationwide group of salespeople with uh, financial analysis, uh, you know, pre-development design engineering services, and I was doing this all across the country because we had uh, multiple branches that were uh, needing support. So I cut my teeth uh, working on projects all over uh, on behalf of Borrego um, from residential all the way through large scale commercial. So when, when did you start to think about how, you know, Green Lancer could be a thing to serve, serve installers across the nation? Well, I, I think it even goes back to those early days of Borrego. Uh, I was, you know, constantly being, queued or requested for drawings uh, by all these sales uh, personnel and everything in sales, you know, it's due yesterday. Right. So in order for me to be able to manage this, uh, this deluge of work that was coming my way, I basically had to standardize my SLA, my service level agreement to my customers, which happened to be internal customers. um, But these were the salespeople I was supporting. And so I started standardizing the deliverables uh, how they could request those deliverables and the time they could expect the delivery back. And if you, uh, you know, fast forward 10 years into what we're doing now, a lot of that is, is, is the same. The only difference is now that we standardize the price as well to go along with that. So then the salespeople knew exactly where they were at in the queue, when to expect their deliverable. And for me, I had a system that I could work within um, that allowed me to support everybody and it was, you know, first in, first out. So if, if you got your work in, uh, you could expect a turnaround in a certain amount of time. And that greatly reduced my stress and anxiety, having to respond and manage relationships with uh, two dozen salespeople around the country. Right. And so I guess when, at what point did you realize that, you know, this, this could serve people other than just you? When did you realize it would actually take hold and, and there'd be a market for it? Yeah, right after the financial uh, recession in 2008, 2009, I was able to start freelancing uh, my expertise. I actually came back to Michigan at that time where I was able to take my solar experience and and become uh, one of the foremost solar experts in the state of Michigan, which, you know, was kind of a backwater for solar. And so uh, I started outsourcing my talents uh, to local contractors here. And then I also became an outside consultant for the local utility here called DTE. Um, and we helped uh, develop and, and install, uh, I think about a dozen or so utility-based projects uh, here in Southeast Michigan. 
Um, and once I started kind of freelancing, that's when I realized that uh, the work was out there, that the industry was growing, there was a demand for it, and the uh, real pain point was that there wasn't enough expertise to go around. And so much in the same way that I uh, standardized my deliverables, my delivery time for different services at Borrego, uh, I decided to take the next step and make those services pretty much the same ones I was doing at Borrego available to installers here in Southeast Michigan. And the only difference is, is that I standardized the price for which they could get that. So most freelancers work on a time and material basis. Uh, we were working on a standardized deliverable basis to where uh, you know, people knew what they were gonna get, how much it's gonna cost and when to expect it before they engaged with us. And that really uh, gave installers, especially here in Michigan, uh, a really good opportunity to be able to gain this expertise in solar without necessarily incurring the overhead that comes with hiring out a new person. And if you can you know, remember back, the solar industry in Michigan was just getting started. So there were dozens of these companies that were essentially startups. Right. And that, I mean, that helps immensely for a solar company because they can forecast, you know, how much it's going to cost for their permitting if they're trying to, you know, get a proposal in front of a customer. Um, and I think it just helps a lot with, with planning um, and, and, and really just being able to plot out what the, the next year, two years looks like. That's right. Yep. It become a variable that's only incurred, a variable cost is only incurred if you sell a project and if you need our services. Otherwise, there's no overhead associated with the resource. So right. it's the on-demand type uh, resource. And this you know, is something that as, as you know, 10 years, fast forward 10 years, uh, subcontracting, this on-demand gig type uh, economy now is it, it's you know, mainstream. At the time, it was still, uh, it was pretty nascent. Right. And so what are some of the services, if I'm a new installer, what are some of the services that that Green Lancer provides that, that I'd be able to get in there and, and kind of book right away? Yeah, I think Green Lancer is mostly uh, known for its design and engineering services. Uh, so these are basically services that help uh, installers get permits from the local building department. Uh, so these are you know, permit drawings, professional engineering reviews uh, that are being completed by our network of fulfillment partners. Uh, we also have proposals, interconnection applications, site surveys, uh, as well as permit expediting services as well. Uh, but I think the, the foremost thing we're known for right now is design engineering based services. Right. And so of these services, if I'm an installer, what, what are my other options as far as, um, you know, if I'm, if I'm considering Green Lancer, well, who else am I considering when I'm, when I'm looking at those, those solutions? Well, you know, 10 years ago, there wasn't a lot of options, but now there's, of course, uh, many more options since the uh, industry has grown. Uh, so you could find a brick and mortar design engineering firm. You can hire somebody internally. You can even go offshore and find uh, offshore design firms, uh, but all of which are basically being managed through email, phone, uh, and different types of, of communication. Uh, there's not many, I guess, engineering resources out there, design engineering resources that have an on-demand catalog that can be engaged with online. And our, the goal of our services and our application is not only to facilitate the uh, access and the checkout of these services that these installers need, uh, but also to be able to manage uh, those in progress as well as after they've been delivered uh, so that there's no uh, issues with communication, everything's on rails, and our team here in Detroit is managing and making sure that all the fulfillment is, is happening as it should. Right. Okay, so basically, you, you sign up for an account, and, and you can actually manage all of this right within your account as far as applying for permits, looking for services, all that type of stuff. Yeah, we, we usually get engaged by the CEO or the chief operations officer, or a director of operations, um, but ultimately who ends up using and utilizing our services the most and interacting with our platform, usually our project managers, even office managers. Um, so you really, anybody, it's intuitive to use and anybody in the, uh, in the company should be able to place orders for this design and engineering, not just other designers and engineers. Gotcha, okay. So it's definitely intuitive to those who are not as technically sound in the solar industry, trying to get up and running. 
That's right. And we, we supply a, a large set of options for each service. So for one permitting uh, type solution, you might have three or four different fulfillment partners that you could pick from, each with a different output, uh, service level, delivery time, revision, uh, policy, et cetera. So we really try to give uh, the installer multiple options uh, to get fulfillment done. And if, if one or the other doesn't work, be able to right size or match uh, the, the type of you know, price, delivery, support that they're looking for with the appropriate fulfillment partner. Right, because I think every, obviously every solar installer or solar company has different needs. So it's That's helpful right. to helpful to have that, uh, you know, options, the options. <clears throat> Um, so I kind of wanted to peel it back a bit, talk a little bit less about Green Lancer um, and more about the industry in general. Um, obviously, you've been in the solar industry for a number of years, uh, and I'd love to get your thoughts on, you know, when you were, were first coming in, uh, you had your perceptions about the industry. How has that changed? How has the industry changed over the years um, from your perspective? Well, we've gone from a backwaters uh, industry, you know, that's that's <laughs> that was filled uh, that was most known to be, you know, full of hippies and and uh, burnouts to uh, becoming mainstream. You know, solar is now uh, almost recognizable by any person in, in the country. Um, the adoption rates are going through the roof. Uh, the costs are coming down. I think the biggest thing that I saw when I first got into solar is that we were selling projects at six, seven, eight dollars a watt. And now I think the average is around three dollars. So in 10 years for something to come down, you know, two thirds of where it was 10 years ago, I think that's probably the biggest, uh, you know, uh, event that has occurred for me. Um, but then also the ability to finance. Uh, zero down solar is a huge thing to, to motivate homeowners. Um, and so we see a lot of our installations that we end up doing designs for uh, being financed by, you know, companies such as Mosaic, Dividend, and, and others that are like Sonova um, that specialize in financing for solar companies and for homeowners. Gotcha. And looking forward, what do you think are the biggest like barriers for solar to continue to not necessarily commoditize, but make it available for, you know, every, every homeowner or business or, expanding on commercial projects, what are those, uh, you know, roadblocks that are in the way for us or for the industry? Well, I think anybody in the industry could tell you that utilities are probably the biggest obstacle that we'll have to overcome to get mainstream um, success. And that's, uh, you know, we see it here locally, uh, you know, the utilities are, are, are essentially passing legislation um, that they're pushing legislation that really makes solar not as on even of a of a of a competition as with the local grid um, and utilities are have really stepped up their efforts to curtail the adoption of solar um, as it you know makes sense it definitely will compete against their uh, supply of energy and their and their consumer base however um, you know as states pass more incentives and pass more uh, you know, renewable energy standards um, and goals. I think that we'll have to figure out how to play nice with the utilities and vice versa, how the utilities play nice with solar. Right. Because at some point, there'll they'll be that tipping point where it just, it doesn't make sense for them to not invest in renewables. Um, so yeah. They want to they wanna essentially own those assets. They don't want those assets on a homeowner's roof where the homeowner actually owns the power that's being produced. So they, they very much want to be in the middle, um, providing the power to the homeowner and taking it away and maybe even making it illegal for homeowners to put solar on the roof. It's not quite to that, that level yet, but as the adoption rates go up, I'm expecting um, some really kind of crazy reactions by utilities. Gotcha. Um, so getting down kind of to the, the last few questions I have. Um, obviously, Green Lancer is a tech accelerator in the industry. I think it's probably, you know, improved and made it even easier for installers to jump in and get permits and solutions. Um, but, you know, for the sake of, of this podcast, um, what other technology uh, platforms or, or disruptors have you seen uh, in your years um, in the industry 
uh, that you'd recommend to an installer or just things you've seen that um, companies that are really changing the game as far as um, making solar more available? Well, I think uh, making solar more available comes down to customer acquisition. And so the most successful companies I've seen have transitioned away from a door-to-door -door selling model into a more digital type uh, acquisition model. So that's using things like SEO, uh, digital marketing techniques to basically drive down that cost of acquisition and increase the lead base. So the companies that are the most digitally adept right now, I think have, have the biggest advantage over the traditional sales process, which is, you know, somebody fills out something on your website or, you know, calls the phone number and you go out. I think the companies that are actively pursuing digital strategies and, and lead acquisition are the ones that are going to win out in the next three years. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. I know a thing or two about marketing. Um, so I guess my next question was, you know, what's the next big disruptor in the solar industry? But um, you might have just answered that with your previous question. But can you, I mean, does anything else come to mind, um, you know, as far as big disruptions that, that could change the industry going forward? Well, the adoption of EV and EV infrastructure is probably going to be a big mover because uh, as soon as you get an electric vehicle, your utility rates um, our, our utility bills, I should say, will be going up. Um, and so uh, EV charging is something I see in the near future as becoming a big mover for solar. But right now, I would say the biggest mover is for solar plus storage. Um, so adding batteries to the solar system. Um, there's a lot of implications, positive implications of doing this. Um, obviously, you have standby power in case the electricity goes out. But there's also ways to, uh, to play the, the rate of uh, basically the power bills that you're getting. If you are have higher electricity bills in the middle of the day and lower uh, rates in the middle of the night, which is called uh, time of use, uh, there's ways that your battery can uh, basically play the uh, grid market. So, uh, you know, releasing energy into the grid in, in the middle of the day when the power is, is most valuable. Um, so these kilowatt hours, instead of being like 13 cents a kilowatt hour, they're now worth like 30 cents a kilowatt hour. And then in the middle of the night, being able to pull from your battery. So there's a lot of exciting things that are going to happen with virtual power plants and with uh, these batteries that people are putting on their solar systems. Gotcha. And last question. Um, so what are you doing personally to um, be more eco-friendly? Well, I haven't had a car in uh, over 12 years. I did just buy a, uh, a COVID van. We're gonna be putting some uh, solar panels on the, uh, on the COVID van. Um, but in general, I think uh, my wife just started working at a recycling uh, facility in uh, Royal Oak. And so we are going to be uh, more, I guess, uh, recycling, uh, you know. Oh yeah. So that's not my, my big thing, but uh, I live in a loft, an apartment, so I can't put solar on my building or anything, uh, but I can, uh, you know, control how much waste I'm putting in landfills. So that's going to be my biggest thing this year. You got to talk to your uh, landlord or building owners. You know, it's, it's funny you say that. I'm actually supposed to be talking with them here at Bedrock. Uh, right. Out of Detroit, so there you go. We're, uh, we're talking about putting some solar up on some pergolas, um, some EV chargers up in some of the garages. And uh, who knows, maybe, maybe the new Hudson site will have a nice big solar array on this rooftop. Yeah, a lot of surface area there. Detroit's that's going it. green. That's right, there is. <clears throat> okay, well, that's, that's all I had uh, question-wise. Um, but I, again, appreciate you jumping on. And uh, um, I uh, think that, you know, there was a lot of great information in this podcast. And um, I wanted to thank you for joining. Well, thanks, Matt. I appreciate being your first guest on, uh, on, the, on the podcast.